Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. In the new film, Loose, uh, our guest director, Julius Ona, and star Kelvin Harrison Jr. dive deep into the stories we tell ourselves about each other and the damaging racial stereotypes that are at play, even in the most well-meaning people in our society. Let's take a look at the trailer. Hi, everybody. Please welcome star Kelvin Harrison Jr. and writer-director Julius Ona. Let's hear it. Hey, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I said this to you in the green room, and there's so much more to unpack, but I love the film, and first and foremost, what I do love about it is that you made a very smart adult film that in no way panders to anybody or makes uh, complicated uh, answers easy for anybody. You just told a really great story that you have to wrap your head around that is very smartly told. Thank you so much. Um, Kelvin, first and foremost, your performance is so nuanced and beautiful, and you have to, in one scene, go from communicating something to the audience to communicating something to the other characters in the scene to communicating almost something to yourself. How did you, uh, how did you modulate those things within scenes? How, what kind of conversations did the two, did the two of you have? Um, a lot of it was, I mean, Julius is a great director and he really knows what he wants and what he wanted to see from Luce and, and, and the tone of the movie and, and how he, where he wanted it to go. So it was just, everything was playing it truthfully. It was like, the whole idea is like, instead of trying to manipulate, it was just like, well, this is the truth and this is exactly what's happening and I don't know, you know what I mean, kind of right. thing. And then. But knowing at the same time what my actual truth is and what my motives are, so then you kind of have to lightly color it throughout, you know, the different beats. I mean, it's it's my interpretation, and it could be and it could be wrong, but I like the interpretation that I don't even think Luce knows exactly what his motives are throughout the whole pro throughout the whole process, and he's figuring it out as the story unfolds, and he's testing everybody. And if they make a wrong move, then he's gonna push a little bit further because therefore he was then correct about what he assumed about them and how that they've been treating him the whole time. So there's a huge sort of minor arc that you that you have to go through throughout the whole film that isn't the normal kind of kind of character arc that we would see in a movie. Did you guys is that an incorrect or No, that is actually incredibly spot on. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. there's there's this <laughs> idea that this 17-year-old kid and he's a 17-year-old kid um, is just this mastermind when at the end of the day what he is is somebody who's incredibly smart but incredibly observant of what's going on around him. He's got a code that he's driven by which is there's a promise that we've made to ourselves in this country about who has access to uh, resources, how we treat people e equally, how justice should work. And when he sees those things not necessarily happening, especially to people like him, and he realizes he's the beneficiary of certain privileges that other people aren't, uh, he feels the need to step up and to use the platform that he has. He starts testing exactly. a little bit. And exactly. as the tests sort of fail or work in certain ways, he tests more and more and more to see what he can, I, what he I can do. I would always describe him to Calvin as a budding revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, and also as this kid who's got this in incredible intellectual horsepower, he's he's got a Lamborghini, but he doesn't have a license to drive yet. Mm -hmm. So, in, in as you said, testing is so appropriate because so many teenagers are testing out the boundaries and limits, and you know what they can get away with, uh, and also trying, as I said, to test what they actually believe and figure it out. Like I think one of my favorite scenes is the first scene that he kind of confronts Octavia Spencer in the debate room because that is something that a teenager, any teenager would really do, right? He has information that she doesn't have mm -hmm. and he's gonna taunt her with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, as a teenager, would have done that in a yeah. heartbeat. It's where she goes that makes that pushes his next step a little bit further. It's a constant back and forth between both of those characters. And you know, for us, and you know, JC would say this very often, it's always so great to have two characters who have a real point of view, a real code that they live by, and then to set those two people against each other. But it's also the fact that they have merits to the arguments that they're both, they both are arguing over the course of a story in terms of his belief that, look, if we're supposed to be in this world, in this society, where people are truly fair and can define themselves, then that should happen. And Octavia's character, who's part of a different generation and a different set of experiences, is saying, look, the world will, nev will never fully accept you for who you want to be, even if you think that might be the case. 
And then you see the back and forth that happens as a result of that. It's so interesting that you say that tangentially. I was listening to an interview with a director this past weekend, and he said, as soon as you set up two people in a scene that are arguing and the audience knows that one of them is right and the other one is wrong, the scene is dead and yeah. it can't go anywhere. Exactly. And it becomes essentially boring and everybody's ahead of it. So, Kelvin, for you, I can't imagine a tougher job than some of these scenes. And I'm wondering, it's really going back to my first question, how much, as much as you're playing it truthfully, you do have to convey very specific things to the audience, the character, and to yourself. Does that come in shot selection with Julius, where you know this is a close-up now, so you can kind of do something that maybe the other is a little bit bigger and the other actor in the scene wouldn't necessarily notice? Yeah, I mean, we did a lot of different takes, and, like, I felt, for me, I did I did the work as, like, uh, I, I kind of, I could play it more, you know, showing the cars and like being a little bit more taunting and provocative and then there's the don't do it at all and and, and just really smile through it and just you know it, and that was also part of the whole we talked about will smith and obama and how you can say something maybe really nasty but at the same time if you say it with a smile and it, it doesn't really come across that way so it's like kind of having all those little tools in my toolbox to play with and mostly the edit to be honest yeah. <laughs> well actually it's a movie with a lot of long takes so there isn't a lot of editing that in certain places they can hide performance and that was one of the things that was really tricky about casting this we needed to have people whether it was calvin or naomi or tim or octavia who in a long take they can just sell it and, and make it work. And what I loved about all these actors is they don't lie. But you probably did have to go into the editing room with options, right? I mean, I'm sure you had a, you clearly had a command over the tone and what you wanted, but I'm assuming that you did need to have some options at yeah, times. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, even in a long take, you're doing multiple takes. So one take can modulate in a certain direction. Another one can go in another direction. So I certainly was giving myself some options, but then, you know, having that complete crutch of like, well, if this line doesn't work in this take and that line doesn't work in that take, being able to always swap that wasn't something that we wanted to do. Um, uh, just because, again, to create the sense of reality, and it's a bit of a heightened reality, but to create the sense of reality of the story, uh, it was important uh, in certain moments to not cut you know, when you cut, you're basically reminding people that you're watching a movie. I mean, there's a sequence in the middle of the film where, you know, Harriet's sister, um, you know, uh, shows up somewhere. I wouldn't say where it is, but that's all a three minute long take. I mean, it's just, it, it's a really, it was a very challenging sequence to shoot. I remember that day for Calvin and Marcia Stephanie Blake, who does an incredible job playing Octavia's sister. Um, and it's in moments like that where if you, it doesn't work in that take, you don't have it. Yeah. I love the fallout after that take. I mean, that take is uh, that scene is wonderful when he is showing his parents the video of that, and he is even testing them then to see mm -hmm. how much they'll watch, how much they'll sort of exploit and kind of delight in this woman's pain. He's curious where they will stand on, on and and how they'll choose now to. Uh, react to Harriet and 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 judge her sister her. and judge her going forward, you know. So that element of testing, right? It's it's always interesting when people have the right set of beliefs that we all want to pr present and perform, and that comes into contact with circumstances where those our interests might be at uh, 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 you know at odds with our beliefs. So that was one of the things that was very interesting to me and JC to to explore over the course of this story. When you set out to direct the movie, did you set up rules for yourself as to how you could film it and how you could direct your actors based off of the story I itself? 100%. Um, uh, I set up limitations for myself right. and limitations for the entire cast and limitations crew. Limitations is a better word. Than yeah, that. yeah. Well, I, th I felt it was really important that the movie was coming through, even though it, there's uh, a subjectivity in terms of sometimes you're with Harriet, sometimes you're with um, um, uh, uh, Naomi's character, Amy, sometimes you're with Calvin. I always wanted it from a mood standpoint to feel like you were in Luce's head. So for the DP, it was, there, here's this kid who's cerebral and smart and hyper-focused. You're never gonna use handheld. It's always going to be, and that that's work to compose these shots and create these camera movements and 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 have a real momentum to the storytelling. Um, you know, for uh, uh, the composers, our we had brilliant team of composers, uh, Jeff Barrow and Ben Salisbury. Usually, you know, they'll they'll get the movie with temp score all over it, and then sometimes you chase that temp score. For them, I said, you're writing the music before you see anything. <laughs> So they wrote the main themes, uh, both the kind of percussive jungle theme and also the, um, the, uh, the, the, the main organ theme 
ahead of time. Um, and then likewise, you have those on set then while you were shooting? Or? No, no, this was, this was before the edit, but, okay. but, but basically I then that helped guide the edit. And then the other thing for the costume designer and the production designer, I told him you couldn't use any red, which was really hard because that just removed all these warm tones out of the film. But the point was to create a real kind of coolness to it. And then also, so when that certain moment comes, when a thing appears in Harriet's house, it's a real jarring experience in the movie and also for the audience. So those kinds of limitations across the board. What was it about a cool experience or a cool environment that, that you wanted? What, do you, what did you think that that conveyed? Well, it was important, again, as I said, to be in Luce's headspace. And he's this kid who, because of his coolness, because of, you know, there's a slight detachment, you're not 100% sure about him. Um, it sort of keeps you a little bit outside of the movie. But then as things start to ramp up, um, and things get hotter, you just feel that intensity. So in the beginning, it was about being a little bit removed. And then the other component of it was also, I didn't ever want the movie, want the movie to ever feel didactic or um, pedantic or instructive in any way. So it also had to have this kind of detachment uh, so that us as storytellers and filmmakers were not telling you what to think, telling you what to feel. There's no like push into the, somebody's face as the music swells up and da 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 da. We really wanted to trust the audience to be able to observe this story and use their faculties to walk away and decide what you think and what you believe. Calvin, I'm curious, at the end of the day, how did you feel about Luce, the character, and how did he affect you as a person? Because there is something so uh, tempting or uh, alluring about being able to be a calculating person who is constantly in control of their environment. Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I've never said this, but like I, I had a, I have a friend <laughs> who reminds me a lot of Luce and I lived with him. And, uh, <laughs> and he, the stories that he would tell me about his past and like how he was raised were kind of similar, but he had this thing about him that was a little cold and like not really checked in completely, but you could, there was so much heart if you got it out of him. So I think looking at Luce and playing, I, I kind of saw the people, at the, I empathized with them and I loved them more, but I also was like, they're very smart and they're just trying to figure it out. And so I think um, when I see Luce, I was like, I don't agree with a lot of the things that he kind of chose to do. And I think that was one of the things we talked about when we first did. I was like, I don't really know what's going on or, I, 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 I kind of, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with Harriet. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I root for the man who who has a, has a purpose and who has a vision for his life and, and for the world and, and wants to fight for something, even if it means they have to take down some people in the process. So I, I, I'm, 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 I'm on the fence. <laughs> yeah, it's hard not to be with Harriet, but again, uh, as much as he's a budding revolutionary, what I do love about Luce is that he's also a, just a teenager he's a kid, and he's yeah. protecting his friends and he's in a battle with a teacher that he doesn't like. And that are these are all things that I think all kids have kind of been through in some ways. It's just that all of the adults in, in his life have raised the stakes on him in this way that is just almost impossible for him to fulfill. I mean, did you ever think about that, that it's mostly the fault of the adults? Well, in it's, world? it's, it's, Part of what was so exciting to me about wanting to tell the story, especially after I read the play, was that generational fault line, right? You have somebody like Harriet, who's the product of the liberal revolution of the 60s, and the language that comes with how you deal with these kinds of issues. Specifically in the African American community, there's, there's people who subscribe to this notion of respectability politics, that to survive in a system that isn't built for your existence, you have to be perfect. You have to be better than the best. You can never mess up. That's the only way you will be accepted by a dominant white society. And you have Luce who's saying, look, I'm a human being, and my friends are human beings. Why should we have to live our lives on a symbolic level? Why shouldn't we have access to the full spectrum of humanity? Everybody contains multitudes. And in fact, to live your life on a symbolic level is dehumanizing. It's just the reverse or the other, or the, the inverse of a certain, of, of the kind of racism that dehumanizes people. In either case, it means not having to acknowledge somebody's full humanity. But Harriet has a legitimate point of view in that you might want to believe that that's the way the world should work. But when you get out of high school, when you get out of college, you're going to be faced with a culture and a society that won't accept you for who you are. And I need to prepare you for that. So going back to that thing you said about 
having a scene where two people have legitimate points of views. I don't think Harriet's entirely wrong, even though I don't necessarily agree with her methods. And I don't think Luce is entirely wrong, even though I don't necessarily agree with his methods. But I think that's the truth of the moment we're living in in this country right now. We have these very complicated issues around identity that we are all struggling with. And I'm not sure we're really talking about them in the ways that we should be. And, and if we don't talk about them, we're going to continue to see the things we see in the news. Well, I think also one of the things that Luce does as a movie is it talks about them. It doesn't answer them. And one of the ways that we're not talking about them is that we're always just looking for an answer. We're always just looking for a simple, clean answer. I think that is something that you're much more allowed to do more often in theater than you are to do in film, simply just because of the... Um, economics of making a movie and having to appeal to such a wide audience. Was there ever a moment where you and your co-writer, who was the writer of the play, were ever tempted or compelled by anybody else to find, to make the film simpler? No, we were very lucky to have people who believed in what we were trying to do. I think for the people who wanted the simpler version of the film, they just didn't become involved. They just, you know, it's the kind of thing they went in the other direction. But for us, it feels disingenuous to tell the story that way. We wouldn't be struggling with all these issues in our culture if there was a one-size-fits-all answer. And I think it's a disservice to audiences to try and distill things into, well, here's the easy recipe to solve it. There'd be no reason to make this movie, or rather, then you make an after-school special. But we really wanted to respect the honesty of the world we live in and the intelligence of the audience that we put a story like this in front of. Kevin, what was it like working with um, this, the actors of this film, Tim, Naomi, Octavia, three incredible uh, actors? It's just, they're so nice and they're so patient with me. And it's just, it was interesting to kind of see what they would do with the silences. And there were a lot of just random beats or like the, just of just kind of, we would do these wonders in the kitchen and stuff like that and how they would fill the space and how they would use the blocking to kind of tell stuff about themselves. And I, I, I hadn't really seen that often because... I haven't worked that much, <laughs> but um, it, they, they were just generous actors, and they, they they go in and they play, and they treated me like a peer, and it was it's it's exciting. What was the toughest part about playing loose for you? Um, or toughest scene that you had to shoot, if you remember, that you were most worried about going into? The speeches were really hard because that they set up the movie and the introduction, and it's just trying to get this this essence of. Who is he when I had so many ideas in my head of all the people, the loose I know him to be because I did the work of like, you know, what was he like in the first seven years before he was adopted or the first 10 years, um, well, whatever it was. But, <laughs> but um, you know, in the trauma and the child, you know, so I have all this stuff in my head, but to kind of wash. What was all that time in therapy like? Yes, yeah. exactly. What came out of that therapy? He's, when did he reach this moment where he could kind of stand out and right. be the best student? And the and dentist son? story. You know, yeah. that was the thing that kept flowing. I was like, he threw a fish. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like these little, ad so I had to create a journal and I had to, this backstory was so thick, but to kind of, Put it, push it all down, and, and, and suddenly become this. I don't know. This this other character, this other performer, was the, was the most challenging part of it all. And to so kind of do that in the speeches was was the hardest part. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I love is that you have done all of that work and you've done all this journaling. But unlike most other movies, and I hate to just keep you know comparing to most other movies, is that the film never gives us an easy answer about Luce at the end of the day. It's not, he is like this because he was a child soldier. He is like this because of the therapy. All of those things are just a part of who he is, and there's mm -hmm. no simple solution or answer to the story. It's so great to hear you bring that up, because you know, often when I was doing friends and family screenings, people are like, why don't you just flash back to when he was in Africa? And I'm like, because that's what every other movie would do. I mean, once you do something like that, then it's very easy for people to say, well, that's the reason he's, he is who he is. When at the end of the day, this is a story about perception. And when you walk down the street here in New York, you don't see somebody and flash back to their past and then decide how you're going to treat them. You see somebody, and on the basis of your assumptions and your personal history, you decide who you think they are, what box you're going to put them in, and how you're going to treat them. So a big part of the story is, is asking how we all participate in the systems of power and privilege that exist in this country. Well, and also how narrative does as well. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking about that flashback and that being the one defining idea of about a person, just as an example, we are, as much as we don't want to admit it, 
trained by movies and television and how we tell stories. And so our perceptions of the world and of people do not contain multitudes because we're looking for that one thing to solely define their misbehaviors or their goodness. Can we take you with you everywhere we go? <laughs> it's, one of the, it's something that I think about a lot, especially right now and in, in where, in, in where we are in this country, because so often it seems that the perceptions that people have of, um, of other ethnicities or just of other people are based off of one sole idea that they think can define an entire story. It or makes person. it easy. It makes it comfortable. It makes it safe. We want to be able to put people in these boxes and these categories means we don't have to do the real work of really looking at another person and and being trying to be honest about who they are and also honest about what we think. And that's, that work is, I, again, I just keep on, every day I open the news and see all these insane headlines. I, I, I'm trying to ask myself, what do I need to do better? What do we as a culture need to do better? And that's part of the reason I wanted to tell stories and make movies, and, and, and this story is, is a part of that, asking those really tough questions. Uh, I think we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who has a question? Hi. Hey. Hi. Um, so I saw the movie at the Tribeca Film Festival, and Thank you. all my coworkers were blown away by your performance. So um, congrats. Um, I have a question. Well, this, excuse me. My question is, what did you learn from yourself as an actor while portraying Lewis? Um, to, <laughs> to trust the director. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's really hard because you most of the time you come in and you, and you do all this work by yourself for like a month and you add all this training and we have rehearsals. And so I have this really set idea of like, okay, well, this is what I need to do and this is how I'm going to have to survive the day. And and, at the, and, the, and then Julius would throw these notes at me and just like, oh, this is too much right now. But at the same time, I was like, once I, when you open yourself up and receive it and listen and just, and, and, and not get so worried that it's going to derail you from what, all the work that you've already done or, or confuse you too much because you're scared that you don't have that you're not good enough or whatever it actually helps <laughs> and i watched it and i was like oh so when he sent me those like these four beats in an email the night before and to take it in i remember we did the speech and he was like maybe we can play it this way and maybe we can have this choice and i was like i can't do all of this today i don't and i don't know how to i can't do all of it i'm just I'm, I, it's too much once i just let it happen it kind of just works out so trust well, trust. <laughs> Thank trust. you. Yeah. Uh, one more. Hey. Uh, I was also fortunate to see it at the uh, Tribeca Film Festival. Fantastic movie. Um, uh, I was wondering, um, uh, you're working with such an all-star cast, some of my favorite actors and whatnot. Uh, how, where, did, uh, where did you reach to kind of get into your, like, raw, like, emotional and very psychological, intense scenes, because it, it, it was, like, scary, creepy good. Like, I left, like, kind of almost, like, haunted in a good way. Yeah. Um, and, and and also just, like, the like, like the movie tone and everything is just so well directed. I was at the edge of my seat the whole time. But, oh, thank yeah. you very much. I mean, look, when you get actors of that caliber, it's also likewise, you have to trust them. You don't always have all the answers. And I had to trust Calvin. There were certain moments when he's like, I'd love to try it this way. And I said, sure, let's do it. You know, um, a lot of that starts in the writing. So JC and I worked very intimately in making sure we had sketched out the characters in the way that, um, you know, felt as complete as possible. But the writing is the writing. When somebody has to live something, then it's a translation from one format to another. So our rehearsal process was a big part of that. And the rehearsal wasn't even necessarily about figuring out all the scenes. Did you was, have a rehearsal process prior to shooting? Or yes, this was, we, wow. we did about a week and a half. And this was just getting into a room and the actors reading some of the scenes and talking to each other and getting comfortable with each other and getting comfortable with me. Because to go to those really scary places, again, it's trust. Can I ask, was uh, the decision to have a rehearsal process most movies don't do that anymore, especially movies at this budgetary level. It's just almost impossible to get done. Did you make that decision and then have to remove something from your shooting schedule or anything like that in order to be able to have that week and a half with the actors? Yeah, it's a huge decision. We had to make some sacrifices. You know, there's things that had to be sacrificed, but I said there's no way we're not doing this without rehearsal. My my background's in the theater as well. Um, and it's just there are too many scary places we have to go to in this film to not have the actors have some kind of intimacy. My biggest fear is when you watch a movie and you're like, oh yeah, those two people, they met at craft service this morning, <laughs> you know, and you could just feel it on the screen and that would never work in this film. Especially with parents and children in it, movies too. Exactly. You can and they were, really feel it Naomi sometimes. and Tim were so great. Oh, 
I mean, uh, Naomi invited you over to her house, and you... Yeah, you we had dinner. We, we The first thing we did was read JC's play with her acting coach, and we sat and read all and talked about it and had a discussion about the themes that were there and the themes that are in the movie now and the comparisons and how are we going to kind of work through that and what's the relationship and how did it grow? And it was like, all this, I was like, oh, wow, this is what and the Tim would also do. invite him to hang out, and yeah. they both, you know, both Tim and Naomi, like talked about the ways they wanted to actually just parent Calvin too mm -hmm. as people. I mean, they're incredibly accomplished actors mm -hmm. and here's a guy who's going to be doing this for a very long time. Um, so there was that relationship off screen that was going to inform the relationship on screen. One of the things that the movie does uh, very well is play on, I think, I don't want to say genre tropes because in no way is this really a genre film, but there are beats of a psychological thriller. And I think there's also beats where you're undercutting what a psychological thriller is. Can you talk about being aware of that genre and when to hit those moments and when to pull away from them? When you knew that it was serving your story or underserving what you were trying to say? Um, well, it was important because, again, when you think about how you want to bring an audience into a movie, it's nice to be able to say, this is part of the experience you're going to have. In fact, I went to film school right across the street from here at NYU, and there's a thing a professor of mine said that I still think is brilliant, Gail Siegel. And she said, genre is a tacit agreement between author and audience. So it basically is saying, all right, come in. Here are these expectations that you're going to have of what you think the story is going to be, but then you can undercut that and really surprise people and take them on a ride and a journey. So for me, that was a wonderful way to keep the story compelling, but then at the same time use that as a vehicle to explore these really complex and hopefully interesting and meaningful ideas. Because I think when, when you tell this kind of story and people just feel like, oh, this is going to be a lecture or, or you know, a, a, a social studies lesson, they run away in the other direction. So with a film, um, um, striking that balance can be really strategic of, no, you will have a compelling, entertaining experience, but we are not going to also, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of take the easy route in telling this story or sell ourselves short just to make it easy for you as an audience. God, can you imagine what this movie would have been if you took the easy route? <laughs> <laughs> like, deeply offensive. It's so, <laughs> so offensive. And look, it was, it was a real tight road to walk, but, but we were lucky to have the right people with us. Uh, well, guys, I don't know if it's clear, but I love the film. Congratulations. So Incredible much. work on both your parts. Uh, when can people see Loose? How can people see Loose? Well, Loose is out in theaters right now. It just opened August 2nd, New York and L.A., and then it's expanding this week. It's going to San Francisco, to D.C. It's going to be rolling out through the rest of the country over the course of the month. Uh, it's an incredible film. Go see it in the theaters. And, guys, give uh, Kelvin and Julius a really big round of applause for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.